I'm curious to hear the story of, um, I mean, was it always called Handsome? Was that the name of the agency right out of the gates? Uh, I don't know how you knew to ask that question. Um, <laughs> I don't either. It was just a thread no, that I wanted no, to pull. <laughs> no, no. So, uh, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't offer this info unless it's asked. Welcome to Obsessed Show, a podcast that is designed to inspire, featuring some of the most creative people in the world. I'm your host, Josh Miles. Let's talk about today's episode. Today on Obsessed Show, I'm chatting with co-founder of Handsome, John Rocher. John is a former military vet who started the company because of a passion for the potential of the internet to explore new ideas and make connections, a similar urge that originally led him to join the military right out of high school. Once COVID hit, though they had worked with major global brands, they'd somewhat lost that love. Looking down the barrel of the pandemic and on the verge of closing, he made the hard choice to tear Handsome down and rebuild it from scratch, culminating a complete rebrand and restructuring, embracing the weirdness he loves about the web. He brought on RGA veteran Jennifer Allen as COO to help lead the charge, and the resulting success was reflected not only in his renewed love for the digital, but growth during the pandemic. So I want to unpack that some more. So we're going to dig into John's story of 2020 and rebuilding and so much more. So without further ado, please enjoy this conversation with John Rocher. Okay, kids, all the way from Austin, Texas, please welcome John Rocher. John, welcome to Obsessed Show. Thanks, Josh. Glad to be here. Hey, it's great to have you. Um, We are early in 2021. It's January at the time of recording, actually inauguration day. How are things in Austin right now? I, you know, I couldn't tell you. I've been in this apartment <laughs> working nonstop the last couple of days. It was beautiful weekend. Um, and then as soon as the weekend was over, it started raining and got gross. So I have literally been in my apartment since Monday um, and today's Wednesday. So, uh, but no, in general, things are, things are great in Austin. Uh, you know, even, even with the pandemic, I mean, besides the economy and obviously health issues and, and all of that stuff, but Austin itself is a great place because there's so much outdoors, uh, you know, so much, so much outdoor activity to be had here and, um, things are a little more spread out than other cities. So I'd say overall, Austin is a beautiful, sunny place, like always. You know, it's interesting is I keep hearing about all these people from California and New York and other parts of the world who are, uh, you know rushing to Austin. So, um, I love, I love the city of Austin. It's one of the places I visited, uh, late in 2019 before we all got shut down, uh, just love the city and can totally see, see the appeal. Um, you know, I'm, I love starting with this question, so I'm going to jump in here as well. Um, as you and I talked a little bit at the top of the show, uh, you're not a designer by background, so I'm really curious to hear your origin story. So tell us a little bit how you got to found handsome as a non-designer yeah well it's a it's a long story and have to go back pretty far um i wanted to be a designer i've always wanted to be a designer uh i've always been obsessed with design which is appropriate fitting for well, the that show. qualifies that's a good start yeah. <laughs> right. um so i think the best way to start this is i s- somehow found the internet when i was probably in junior high early high school um grew up in a small town near Austin called Lockhart and a uh, really small town. This was in the late nineties, uh, 2000, early two thousands, around 2000. And, um, you know, in between it was too hot to skateboard. And so I retreated inside and found a computer, found the internet and be- somehow be- became obsessed with just kind of picking apart websites. The idea that mm-hmm. you can, Come up with this I come up with this thing, visualize it, whether it be just aesthetic and beautiful or interactive. I think what really intrigued me was in you know early, early days of chat rooms and things like that, where you could connect with people across the world. I mean, think, you know, 1996, small town in Texas, being able to talk to people all over the country or all over the world. And that was really interesting to me. And then somehow stumbled upon the graphic design community. And I think in those early days of the internet. Um, it was very much graphic designers, print designers, art directors, um, communication artists, as they were called even before that, that were trying to figure out how to make things digital on the internet. And so there were communities that developed and I kind of fell into that a bit. I really wanted to emulate that. 
Um, I tried my hand at designing things and I couldn't. So then I reverted to coding. So I taught myself how to develop websites um, that looked like the things that people were designing. Um, so fast forward a little bit through that, joined the military, as you mentioned, um, veteran. And uh, again, like that was very much about getting out of that small town, seeing the world, doing something big, making connections, um, and, uh, and kind of trying that path uh, versus the more traditional path. And then fast for a little bit more, getting out of the military, had to do something um, because you're kind of plopped right out of the military in the civilian life. And uh, I didn't go to college, obviously. Um, and so I picked back up my skill of building websites and started doing that for money. Uh, still very obsessed with design, really wanted to really honed my front end development skills because I wanted to be able to emulate really good design. Um, and that just kind of snowballed into work that took the shape more, you know, less of built coding websites and more of doing strategy for technology and what is, how we're going to take this business online and digitize this. Um, and so I found myself doing projects, big and small, um, very high level strategy, all the way down to coding WordPress websites. Um, always wanting to work with better and better designers being very interested in that. Um, and then, you know, and then it was kind of a point where I, I don't know if it was boredom or frustration, but I got tired of not being able to do things the way I thought they should be done in this better way. And it was, there were really two reasons why I couldn't, I kind of boiled it down to, and one was I didn't know how to do it. I mean, I knew there was a better way to do things, but I, I wasn't the artist myself. And this is both aesthetically and, and, you know, visual design, but also strategy, UX design, things like that. I, I knew that they should be done that way. I couldn't do it myself. And, uh, and also I couldn't get clients to trust me to do it because I was a one person shop and, um, and I would build teams and then those teams would dissipate after projects. And so the answer, clear answer to that for me was start an agency. I mean, how do you, how do you solve those two problems? Well, you, you build a team around you that's permanent, that's smarter than you at these things. Um, and you use that to build a brand to then get clients to trust you to employ these, uh, these different methods. And, um, so that's what led me to starting handsome. That's the long story. And that's also how I got interested in design. Yeah, that's super cool. Um, I'm curious to hear the story of, um, I mean, was it always called Handsome? Was that the name of the agency right out of the gates? Uh, I don't know how you knew to ask that question. Um, <laughs> I don't either. It was just a thread no, that I wanted no, to pull. It <laughs> no, no. So, uh, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't offer this info unless it's asked. Um, no. So it, it had a different name. Um, the name was Bad Panda. And I think maybe that was a name that we, that, that we named ourselves in order to force us to come up with a better name. <laughs> <laughs> um, but... No, so so we so it kind of kind of this is actually kind of how the name Hansel came about. And so we had a name we didn't like, and so we mm -hmm. were forced to sit down and brainstorm. All right, what what are we going to name this thing? Well, how do you come up with a name? I mean, we were we were pretty sure we didn't want to go down the kind of obvious route of one eight hundred websites, mm -hmm. um, and we didn't want to go down the kind of abstract route that we already had. And bad panda means nothing. <laughs> right. um, and so we wanted to come up with a name that that meant that stood for the work that we were going to do, some kind mm -hmm. of value connection to the work. Mm -hmm. we were doing. So um, the things that we believed in and started the agency, and these reasons why I why I want to start the agency to begin with, was um, was was thinking about what makes things successful. Um, things being person, place, thing, idea, um, in any in anything, what makes them successful, and it's. The fact that humans are attracted to them, that humans have a desire to interact with them and to have a relationship with them. And so we were looking for a word that meant beautiful, attractive, desirable, um, and also a word, and this is where handsome came, where we landed on handsome, was uh, that for us, handsome means, meant, and still means something that has the same level of quality on the interior as it does on the exterior so it's about mm -hmm. beautiful aesthetic and attractiveness and beauty but not skin deep um, it's about integrity well thought through it's the soundness of construction myself being having an engineering development background but being obsessed with design i cared very much about beauty and how things were built as much as how they looked and how they worked um, and so that's what handsome meant for us that was kind of tying the bow around 
around that concept was handsome. And then also it helped that it was a word typically used to describe humans. Um, I guess in our culture, it's typically used to describe men or male. Um, that wasn't the point necessarily, but it was a human thing. So it's kind of this idea we could add a human-like attractiveness and desirability to the non-human things that we were creating. We thought that would make it more successful. So at the end of the day, we could say we make handsome products or handsome brands. Yeah, well, I want to talk about the things that led up to the rebrand. Um, but, you know, just tagging into your comment there, like, I love the idea, too, that handsome can mean, like, price, too. Like, oh, they paid handsomely for that. Or there's, you know, yeah. a handsome reward out for this thing. Or um, so there's, like, this idea of quality or something that's deeper um, than just the aesthetic, like you're, yeah. like you're saying. So I think that's a really cool piece to that name. And that's always um, resonated with me. And, uh, as we were joking at the top of the show, now that you've gone through a rebrand, like my former agency and your former brand totally coincidentally launched about the same time with this like bow tie logo. So it's, mm -hmm. it's fun that we're both not only obsessed with design, but also have that, <laughs> the bow tie logo in our, in our history. But, um, so I'm really curious about, um, 2020 and, you know, reading this, um, kind of the, the overview of the background of, you know, knowing that, um, things were tough and you'd gone through some amazing clients and worked with some, some big projects, um, but ultimately led you to kind of tear it down and start over. Well, walk us through what happened there. Like what, what take us back to that point when you realized it's time to kind of start fresh. Well, there's, there's no doubt. I'm, I'm very proud of all of the work that we did the eight years prior to that. I mean, we really started the rebrand about a year before, you know, we didn't start it in March of 2020. So it almost coincidentally, and I'll, I'll kind of talk to about why, why that timing happened the way that it did, but we started, mm -hmm. we started before we've, we've always been, I'd say a little uncomfortable in our own skin, as far as a brand, um, as far as the agency goes, the, the things that we cared about day one, we still care about. Um, we care about beauty. We care about that level, that integrity that I talked about. We care about uh, the quality of design and, and, and you know holism and things that I could talk about with the brand. We've always cared about those things, and so I feel like while the work reflected that, the the business and the way that we approached engaging with clients and the way that we approached the culture and the way we approached building the teams and talent and all of those things weren't quite weren't quite right. And the brand itself was almost, I dare to say, far from right. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it, it came out of just you know, being uncomfortable and, and not content with the way that we looked and showed up in the world and talked about ourselves externally and understood our values internally. So, and, and again, that, that had, that, that was just, it was about, it was about just as much about the external brand and presentation as it was how the agency was organized um, and even the business model. Uh, and so we were, we were, you know, we knew that was going to happen. We were spinning our wheels a bit on it. You know, there was a lot of common sense things and hindsight we should do and these kinds of things, but we were busy. We were doing work. Um, if, if we weren't busy delivering work, we were busy figuring out how to deal with the, the ebbs and the, you know, the, the hard times and going through those cycles. And so it was either like super busy delivering, doing great work or super busy figuring out how we're going to deal with the slow times. Um, and so we were dragging our feet on re on, you know, doing these things we wanted to do, reinventing the agency. And that's when COVID happened and we were like, Oh crap. So we're coming out, you know, we're, we're doing great work. We have money. I wouldn't say we're healthy. Um, but we're, we're young and able to be unhealthy is kind of the way they kind of looked at it as the agency. Uh, business wasn't that healthy, but we're doing great work and happy and just power through it. And then COVID hit and no one can power through that. So we were forced to either give up and stop. Um, we, an option on the table was shrink back down to just the founders and just focus on just let's do one great project at a time, kind of boutique style. It's, that's fun and rewarding. Um, or let's build a new set of rules, how we're going to run the agency. And let's either let's live or die by these new set of rules. And if we die, that's okay. And if we live, then great. Now we have a new agency. Um, and so it was both a new set of rules of how we run the business or you know, operationally and organizationally. And let's finally be who we want to be. Let's be weird. Let's be fun. 
let's bring human emotion into it, not be the black and white bow tie, um, sharp edges and masculine and, Mm -hmm. uh, too afraid to say anything because we can't get it right and get it perfect. So let's, let's be a little more open and and relax with our brand. All the things that, you know, if looking at Hanson before the rebrand, you would think that we all wear either super, you know, hipster turtlenecks or, or suits with black ties and uh, we're we're real buttoned up and stuffy um, and uh, pretentious and arrogant. Um, And if you, but, but then if you met us, we're not, it's not who we are at all. And so, so to kind of to wrap it up, we've, you know, launching of the brand was accelerated by COVID happening. We kind of forced our hand to either kind of do it or don't do it. Um, and, we, and we were like, okay, well, let's build a new set of rules. Let's live by those rules. And let's finally be who, be who we're going to be as, externally as a brand. Yeah, I love that. I mean, I'm certainly passionate about brand, all things brand. So understanding that the rebrand really came out of better expressing on the outside who you guys already were on the inside. I think that's always a recipe for a great rebrand. Um, I'm, I'm curious about kind of the, the operational structural stuff. So, Mm -hmm. um, you know, some of the people we've talked to have great, amazing brands and they're effectively solopreneurs who occasionally bring in contractors. Um, and then, you know, we've talked to other agency principals who, you know, run multi hundred person firms. And I'm kind of curious how you guys are staffed, now and if if that's changed uh, you kind of alluded to should we shrink back or should we stay the same um where where did you land on that so i actually a little bit in the middle um when before covid and uh, yeah i mean so it's it's not just a cliche i mean covid will be a landmark milestone of change for us and so i'll, I'll keep referencing that as in, in the timeline but um be, before covid handsome we're founded in austin we started here. We got an office on the east side in Austin as soon as we could, about a year into the agency, moved into a big fancy office a couple blocks away on the east side, prime location, um, about five, six years ago now. And uh, 100% of the agency worked out of that office full-time. And 100% of the, agent, of the agency was full-time employees. Um, we, you know, we hired here in Austin. We moved people away from here, you know, from away to here in Austin. Um, and that was very much a part of our culture. And, and I think it was a good thing in, in a lot of ways that allowed us to have a culture and have an identity, but it limited us in a lot of ways. And so I think one of the biggest changes that happened with COVID was, again, we we wanted to, we knew that Austin, that being in this bubble in Austin, as beautiful as it is, was limiting. It's not New York. It's not LA. It's not San Francisco. It's not the rest of the country. Um, and, and, and it was limiting in a lot of ways. And so we knew we were limited. We wanted to bring people from in from the outside, but our mindset was relocate people to Austin. And while Austin's a great attractive place, it's difficult to relocate the best talent in the country to come live in Austin. You're, gonna, you're not going to get everyone. So another example where COVID forced our hand and said, okay, well, there's no excuses anymore. You don't have to, and it makes no sense to be limited by being in Austin. So we started bringing and hiring people from anywhere. So now I'd say one of the biggest changes is that there are more people that work for Hanson that aren't in Austin that are in Austin. Um, And so our Austin headcount has, if it hasn't shrunk, it certainly shrunk in terms of percentage makeup. Um, Mm -hmm. I think it may even have shrunk net headcount. A little bit, or it's net even. While you know we've practically doubled or almost tripled uh, headcount size in the last twelve months, and um, I'd say exaggerate a hundred percent of that growth has been satellite spread out and uh, distributed across the mm-hmm. country. And that's a that's a huge change for our culture and a huge change to the model. Are your folks that are in Austin? Are they? Are you guys all working remotely still at this point? We are. Yeah. So that beautiful office I talked about on the East side is sitting there dormant. <laughs> yeah. We're all working remote, you know, and, and we've had to reset, you know, it's, it's been right. interesting you know, resetting our mindset. Uh, we don't, you can't just throw out a time on the calendar t- 10 AM because we have people on the West coast, people on the East coast. And that means something totally different. Mm-hmm. Um, like that's, that may seem common for people who have worked with multiple offices across the country, but when hundred percent of your staff is within a, 10 mile radius of each other in Austin in one time zone. It's a pretty big cultural, diff- pretty big cultural shift. Yeah, totally agree with that. I've been, um, remote myself. My 
mothership is in uh, the DC area and I'm in Indianapolis, which is like just barely still Eastern time, like just a little bit West of here. Um, it goes, goes to central. Um, so it, it was really fortunate for me that, that I'm at least Eastern as far away <laughs> as I am. Cause that way we're all in the same time zone. Um, I know even since your, your relaunch, um, you've been doing work for, uh, some pretty amazing clients like Facebook and Visa and Axios. Um, um, do you credit that to kind of the momentum that handsome had pre rebrand or do you credit that to, um, the repositioning or relaunch? So I credit that to the momentum we had pre rebrand, but the well, relaunch, I, I'm not sure yet that the rebrand has had any effect because the rebrand happened um, November, basically. So okay. we're talking three months ago. So I don't know that that's had any impact in terms of new client acquisition. Um, but what the relaunch has has done in terms of the reworking of our model and some of the things that we've changed about how we work is with those accounts, we're doing much more. Um, we're doing service off, you know, our, our service offering has expanded from being fairly focused and small to including, I mean, we're basically a fully integrated digital agency now for some of our clients um, doing full brand and, and product and mark, you know, digital marketing work. Um, and we weren't doing that before. So I think one of the things that has, you know, those names you mentioned, you know, I'd say two years ago, they would have been clients, but we would have not had such a strong and deep and integrated relationship with them. Yeah. That's super cool. Um, tell us about your role in particular. So we've, you know, interviewed lots of CEOs on the show and I'm, I'm curious, um, you know, some of them are more design leaning, so they end up still kind of in the day to day and the pixels and the vectors, um, or at least art directing, um, you know, some of them are more purely, uh, operational. Some of them are more high level, you know, leader with a capital L. So they're kind of directing things or more business development focused and, and lots of them do a little bit of all those things. So kind of curious what maybe a typical, day or week or month looks like for you, what kinds of roles you're playing yourself? I'm, I'm probably following the category of a little bit of all of the above. Uh, I feel like my role and and maybe this is, maybe I need a coach because maybe this isn't the best answer, but <laughs> I feel like my role is always in a, t- in a state of tug of war. Um, I'm either, I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'm either dealing with day-to-day minutia and wishing I was thinking longer term, higher level, or thinking longer term, higher level, and neglecting something that's core, key to our culture. I'm either uh, in super in the work and not paying enough attention to new business and helping shape the work that does come in. I think it's an important part of my role is to shape the work that comes in um, directionally. And so I might be too focused on shaping the work that we're putting out, not, not focused enough on shaping the work that comes in or vice versa. So I think, um, you know, I, I, I look at that as, is a balance since I think my, while I don't, you know, I, I don't have to do anything. So what I choose to do is key. Um, and I think most everyone else in the agency doesn't have that opportunity or challenge, which I think is unique to the CEO role. Um, so what I find myself doing today, uh, is I've, I think as of, you know, the last couple of months, I have found myself in a good balance of those things. Uh, I'm getting back into, you know, as a kind of a cyclically getting back into paying attention to the work and quality. Um, I, I identified a few things that for, it's not a, not an annual thing, but just coincidentally for 2021 that I'm going to focus on more. And one of those things is quality. Um, and that has to do with shaping the work that comes in, but also more and probably even more emphasis on the work that goes out. Um, and so spending a lot of time with the team thinking and talking about quality, pushing quality, um, thinking about recruiting and the kinds of people we can bring in to help push quality, both in culture and the work we do. Um, and then spending time in, in business development, spend a good amount of time. Uh, you know, ideally at our size now, I am not the tip of the spear on anything. Mm -hmm. So I tend to find myself talking internally a lot to people who I'm letting them be the tip of the spear when it comes to business development or creative direction, project lead, account account leadership, and things like that. 
Um, yeah, so it's it's uh, usually in a state of imbalance, unusually right now fairly balanced and uh, kind of in a good equilibrium. I think, um, I don't know if it was an epiphany for you, but um, <clears throat> hearing you say the words, I realize I don't have to do anything so I can really choose where to focus. I wonder how many agency principals or owners or even solo entrepreneurs feel that way, um, that they, that they realize that they have that freedom, or at least I would think in your case, maybe you shaped it that way. Um, was, was that an idea that you had early on, or has this been a, a long time thing or is this a recent change for you? Well, that's a good question. I haven't really thought about that because I, you know, one of the things I do think about in terms of my origin story and how I've gotten where I am now and what I'm, what I can learn about that that I take forward is that I've constantly been like, like I said, in the very beginning, I'm obsessed with design. I can't design very well. Um, so I've always been finding people that are smarter and better than me at parts or pieces of this whole pie and Mm -hmm. putting them in a position with other people that make up the whole pie to build a strong team. And so I think if there's anything I am the best at, it's building a team of people that are better at everything than I am. So I think because of that, they, that might be why I naturally find myself in a position of not, not having to do anything. And what I mean by that more is, I mean, sure there's, there's fires every day and there are opportunities every day and I should do a lot of things, but I don't have to. Um, and so I, I, you know, I have, I find myself at, at any given moment having too much things that I, too many things that I could do. So I get to pick and choose. And I think, uh, I think that is probably accidentally by design because of what I said about, you know, my, my, my mindset is trying to find people that are smarter than me to do things. And, uh, and also because of the position I'm in. And I think, I think anyone who's, anyone who's at the top, whether it's the top of a, per, of a one team, one, one person team, or the top of, you know, a thousand person team, you, you know, if you have, you know, I, I say, you know, I have, I don't answer to anyone, but I also can answer to everyone. Um, and so it's that same kind of thing where I have too many people to answer to. So then I have to choose and prioritize. But I, so I think for that, I think anyone who's in my position should think of, should free themselves of feeling, you know, concretely obligated to do anything and be, and really think about what it is that they want to invest and spend their time on. Yeah. I think that's great. Um, I was going to ask you what you felt like, um, you learn most from your military experience that you're applying to your agency. Um, the, maybe the team building thing is something that I'm hearing as a, as a theme, but I'm, I'm curious if there are other things or if that's even related um, or in, in your estimation, what do you think you brought over from that experience? Yeah. I used to think it was nothing. So there was a phase where I went through where I was post rationalizing a bit, trying to find something to make up to say, yeah, it was it's teamwork and discipline. Mm-hmm. Like, that's what it is. Um, a sense of honor or whatever. Um, and then there was a moment where I was like, nothing. It was, you know, it was a moment in my life. It, you know, um, I think now I'm starting to realize that there are some things that I learned that, uh, that are kind of personal tendencies, values, ways that I look at the world that, that must have come from there because I don't know where else it would have come from in my life. Um, and I think one of the biggest things is, is, you know, grace under pressure. Um, and I, I don't know that it was teamwork necessarily. I think there are some things I learned about the value of uniformity and the value of doing something that in a micro sense, doesn't make any sense. doesn't seem valuable, but in the macro sense is part of a bigger part of a bigger purpose, bigger mission. And that definitely is common sense to me at this point, And maybe isn't as common sense to other people who get hung up on why am I doing this one thing? Doesn't make any sense, but there's a bigger picture at play. Um, but I think really it's the kind of grace to resolve under pressure. I mean, as, as you know, and as a lot of you know entrepreneurs and, and, and leaders know, shit happens like all the time. It's like, you know, if, if you're in a, if you're in a low moment, it's going to get better. If you're in a high moment, it's going to get worse. Um, and so just knowing that and being able to kind of float above that a little bit and be like, okay, bullets are hitting the wall behind me. Like 
calm down. You got to do something. It's going to be okay. Or it's not. And that's fine. You know, like having that kind of thing, I think is one of the biggest things that I took away from the military. And while the room was on fire figuratively in the business, and maybe some of my other partners or other leadership were running around with their hair on fire, I was more calm and able to deal with the situation and navigate through it. And I think that's something I, I definitely do credit to my time in the military. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, what would you count as um, your proudest professional moment or maybe maybe one of your proudest professional moments? I, yeah, I, I think, you know, that they're, they're, it, it's all, it all comes down to the people that I work with, the people that have joined the team. I mean, for me, a, a kid, I didn't go to college, came out of Lockhart, Texas, small town with, you know, unless you're a farmer, there's not really much there for you. Um, and now, you know, when I was 25, 26, 30 with a team of people that some of them older than me, that I was, you know, they, they were buying houses and having kids and, uh, and things like that. And for me, that was just unreal. And it still is. Um, and so I think it, it's, it's a, those moments have been extremely proud for me. Some of the, the tear jerkers of, having uh, of having a company is seeing you know a, a parent have a child a first child go on parental leave and be able to fully support them through that i think mean, that's amazing um and then the other thing with people and the team is is winning whether the win is winning a pitch that we should have like have no business winning but we did and we killed it and we killed the work nailed it um kind of looking around the, like at the partners and be like really did that really happen <laughs> um, <laughs> And also winning in terms of delivering amazing work that, change, that changes lives. You know, uh, we we delivered a project for Facebook that uh, has to do with health, and uh, it's Facebook putting the power of its network uh, and data to to work on uh, solving systemic health problems. It's a new product in, in the Facebook app um, that helps with preventative health health measures and connecting people, and that kind of thing. Just thinking about where it came from and the fact that my team was able to do that completely in house at, at, at the agency with a small Facebook cohort, uh, is amazing. Like that, that kind of thing is an extremely proud moment. And if, if we went out of business tomorrow and closed up shop, I would be extremely proud of what we've accomplished through moments like that. So I would assume that's a, a feature that our listeners could go check out. How would they find that within the app? Uh, we can go to preventativehealth.facebook.com. Or in the app, you can go into the kind of the smaller features and sub apps within the Facebook app and, and find that. Cool. Well, we'll definitely uh, link to that in the show notes, assuming that that you're logged into Facebook, that should that should work. Um, yeah. I'm curious about this question, too, because because of your background. But um, tell us about any design heroes that you've had either kind of coming up in the biz or ones that you have currently. Yeah, yeah, that that's a, that's a fun question because I, stuff I don't get to talk about very much, and maybe I should. But you know, I mentioned that my my background, I small town, found the internet. Actually, found the internet through the public. Well, I mean, you know, my my parents had a computer. My dad was into computers, but I really spent my time learning the internet, learning how to code, and connecting at the public library on the computer, mm. which is quite interesting. Um, and so somehow I stumbled upon design communities, which was a thing in the late 90s, early 2000s. I'm sure they may exist today, but there was an agency called Cuban Council that um, existed. I think they, well, they, they were acquired by Google sometime in the, in the early, mid-2000s. And um, they, you know, they, they were kind of at the center of, they created a community called Caliber 10,000. There was a community called News Today. And um, and, and a couple of others in the same kind of space. And these were places where designers, I mean, almost entirely at that time, traditionally graphic designers, print designers who were making their way onto the internet um, would come and they would talk about design. They would share stuff. And it was both, it was like slightly dribble-esque and work was being shown off. But that was probably 10 to 20% of what was happening. The rest of it was just banter, culture. (laughs) And I loved that culture. And so I got extremely obsessed to the point where I was picking those sites apart from getting into the code and looking at how they did it and looking at how they, you know, looking at every single GIF and Sprite, which was a thing back then, kind of building a UI out of Sprites out of of, uh, GIFs and um, and the code. And 
So I started looking behind the scenes at who was making these things. And uh, it was a guy named Mike Buzzard, who was a founder of Cuban Council and uh, was also played a, a pretty big role in those in a couple of those design communities that I mentioned. And as far as I could tell at the time, he wasn't a designer. He was a front-end developer or a web developer. And so that really fascinated me that someone who someone could be so involved and influential in the design scene and making these these websites and communities and work that I look up looked up to at the time that really influenced me to get started, um, but was doing it from a developer and being involved mechanically uh, and strategically in the work in, in that work. And so that inspired me a lot. I think he was one of the design heroes. He works at Google now after Cuban Council was acquired by Google. Um, you know, another now, and so I get a lot of inspiration. Kind of, I take the design hero and inspiration question. Uh, in tandem, but I, I get yeah. a lot of inspiration from from physical, real life experiences. Um, so, uh, and one of the best places for that is hospitality. And it just got when I mean, COVID kind of kind of shut that, put that on pause for me in, in a lot of ways. But before mm -hmm. that, with all the work travel and those kinds of things, getting very into hotel boutique hotels, cocktail bars, restaurants. Uh, the hole in the wall restaurants who got it right, the big fancy, big productions that got it right and really getting obsessed with the design of experience in hotels and hospitality and things like that. And there's a, there's a group here in Austin called McGuire Mormon Hospitality, and they are responsible for some of the best restaurants and hotels in Austin. And uh, so, you know, I pay really close attention to what makes a restaurant different than another restaurant or a bar. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I use that as a metaphor a lot in the work that we do because, you know, people ask me what's, what's, what's different about handsome than any other agency. And I start to use the metaphor of restaurant, but like, well, if you take the ingredients, nothing, you know, there's eggs and lettuce and corn. It's the, it's the same core ingredients. It's, it's what you care about. It's the experience you build around those things and what you value. And so to talk about design heroes, I think what McGuire Mormon hospitality does as a restaurant hospitality group um, is fascinating to me. So, um, speaking of things that are fascinating, kind of the theme of the show is obsessed. Um, I'm curious, and your answer doesn't have to be design related, but I'm curious what you find you are most obsessed with right now. Well, it is, uh, well, besides mountain biking, it's not design related, but, uh, no, in, 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 in work, which is, which I am genuinely obsessed with is, is a, a re a reignited obsession with human centered design. And so it's a, it's an obsession with humans. And I think that I'm, I'm excited now to peel back even more layers of what makes humans human and take it all the way back to, you know, some of the things that inspired me to even get into art at all. When I was young with skateboarding, um, and skateboarding videos and skateboarding magazines and those things were raw and you know there was design there but it was very raw it was very culture driven very unapologetic and very human and I think and so I think that's just an example of how you know I'm thinking of, I'm becoming obsessed again with how to approach human-centered design human-centeredness in a new way that's actually human and not scientific and abstracted out. I think that UX design for all the great things that it has done has turned design into surgery a bit. Mm -hmm. um, it's over-scienced it. And so I want to get back into the understanding humans from a story perspective, from a life and motivation and emotion perspective, and do things that maybe, uh, you know, approach design not to answer the question of, how do we make this the best thing for people to use and experience, but how do we make this something that people absolutely want to experience and use? Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's an obsession. And I think, I think along with that goes an obsession with holism and holistic thinking, which is kind of an evolution of systems thinking and uh, very obsessed with the idea that changing one aspect of a system has an impact on the rest of the system. And so um, you know, really thinking hard about how we think micro and macro, how we look at problems, how we think about solving a problem, what happens when we solve a problem for one user um, or one customer, what happens to all the rest of customers, what happens to the timeline over time, like what is the butterfly effect of making a change or an impact 
of, for a brand or a digital product or a customer touch point? And how does that affect other demographics? How does that affect the future? What are the implications of that? How do we create an organ set this organization up for success and in, in owning that and scaling that? And so getting going harder on holistic design and going harder on human centered design is uh, what I'm obsessed with. And I know those are, those are buzzwords and we kind of joke about that because we went to rebrand the agency and we took the two things that we've always talked about and put them front and center. And that's not really a rebrand or a reimagining. And, uh, but I'm not, you know, I don't apologize for that. We are going harder. You know, we're, we're blowing up human centered design. We're blowing up holistic design and we're going to start over again and, and, and be obsessed with them. And that's, that's genuinely my obsession. Yeah. I love it. Um, I'm curious, you know, with all the cool things that you guys have done already, are there any dream projects that you're thinking about or things that you haven't had a chance to uh, work on yet that you're hoping to in the future? So, you know, I think for me personally, a dream project would be something that connected physical experience. So uh, environmental experience with physical experience in terms of a physical product or object and digital experience. And so, you know, I talk about human center, I talk about holistic, a project that really gets to exercise those ideas. Um, and, and the best kind of project to exercise those ideas is something where you're in some kind of environment, you have a physical object and it relates back to digital, we get to use data. So I think about Nike Fuel Band, um, mm -hmm. that's old now, but as a case study and idea, it's still extremely relevant. Um, if people were to think these this way and they are, you know, internet of things and everything's smart and connects to each other and stuff like that. But Nike fuel band invented that, uh, invented that concept, or at least really drove it home and mainstreamed that concept yeah. in the beginning. And so something like that combined with like Strava and the intelligence that Strava has now and how it can sense, you know, for example, since two people are on a run or on a ride together and suggest that give you insights about what you're doing, but, not, but in a way that people actually enjoy and is very niche. So, you know, if we were to apply those same concepts to other things, uh, other parts of health and wellness, I think those would be the makings of a dream project. So like Freddy Player One. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. And, you know, we, we, we actually do a lot of work in virtual reality um, with Facebook and Oculus and, mm. and others that we're going to announce pretty soon. Uh, and so we, we get to talk about those concepts uh, you know, really, it's 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 augmented reality. You know, it's a uh, you know, it's it's augmented reality. It's virtual reality, but you know, trying to combine the two but make it a part of your actual day to day through some kind of hardware and connecting to what you do on a day to day basis. Yeah, I mean, that Ready Player One kind of thing. That's maybe if maybe a couple you know, if Ready Player One is twenty years down the road, then the thing I want to be working on the thing that's three to five years down the road. Yeah. Um, I'm curious, especially with all of the interactive and digital experiences that you guys uh, are part of and have been exposed to, if there's anything, you know, trend or user experience or anything that you see that kind of drives you crazy, like that you wish would just go away or people would just stop <laughs> anything that uh, kind of uh, triggers that response from you. Um, you know, I, I think that I, I mentioned my issue with UX design and traditional human centered design. And so things where things that are over UX um, and what I mean by that are, are experiences where you've optimized to the point of, of making it either too, uh, you know, too same, mm -hmm. too, too much like everything else or uh, too vanilla, too uninspired. So there's, there's, you know, I think UX design, and these are big statements, you know, I'm obviously I'm generalizing and there are great UX designers out there who break this, but in general, I think the practice of UX design is counter to inspiration and counter to creativity. And so, um, and again, I'll say this again, there are great UX designers out there who or just prove me wrong. I think that's great. We want more of that. Um, but where we don't have, you know, where UX design, where design excludes creativity, um, that really bugs me. And, uh, and so, you know, I think of creativity as the perfect balance or harmony of novel, appropriate, and quality. 
So something that is novel, something that's new, hasn't been thought of, haven't, hasn't been applied before, um, but is highly appropriate. So not, not new for new sake, but actually solves a problem and new thing solves a problem in, in, in a better way. And then extremely high quality. And I think what bugs me is when it's blatant that only one or one and a half of those has been applied in any product or experience that really bugs me a lot. Yeah, I think there's the the issue of, you know, if you call it best practices and as people kind of circle the drain of best practices and everything starts to feel more and more and more alike. And it just, um, maybe from a user standpoint, that's what's proven to work. But from a brand standpoint, if every social network for, for example, starts to look the same, then how do you differentiate the experience from one to the next? Or they all have the same features, like why use one over the other? I think that's where, um, you know, differentiation and preference start to, um, get really challenged where everything is just more me too. Yeah. Circling the drain is a great way to put it. Um, I, you know, I'm, I'll, I'll be blunt, you know, I think it's, it, it is that, and the argument that, you know, being data driven in design is not a bad thing as an ingredient, but it's like, you know, it's ginger, you know, you don't want to <laughs> want to put three pounds of ginger and, you know, two ounces of coconut milk. You just can't, like, it doesn't work. Right. So I think that what, what happens is that if it's data driven to an extent where people, it, it goes back to, if you ask people what they want to tell you faster horses, well, that's the same thing with UX design and the way that data, dri- you know, being data driven and being best practices oriented, people choose your, people choose your solution maybe because they weren't able to see something that they couldn't have thought of unless you would have created it for them. And that's where I think creativity is. I I, want to be creative first, you know, handsome and myself always been very strong at human centered user centered UX design, research backed, evidence backed and data driven information architecture, traditional interaction design, UX design. I want to start. and, And I believe that we should be starting with be really human centered. Think about creativity. Think about giving things that people don't expect, not the lowest common denominator of what they do expect. And that's uh, very passionate about that. Yeah, that that definitely resonates with me, Um, especially being um, away from kind of the UX and design uh, uh, professionally here for a couple of years. It's just refreshing to hear people talking about that. So I love the idea of kind of bringing the human and creativity piece, uh, forward. Um, you know, just get a few more questions here before we wrap up. Um, I'm curious in particular, if you have a favorite piece of advice that you share with your team or maybe a favorite piece of advice that you've received that's still, uh, app- applicable today. Yeah, I think, um, my advice tends to be very simple and traditional. It's the, you can do it. Um, it will get better <laughs> kind of advice. <laughs> you know, I think it's like kind of back to basics on like, sometimes it takes that like, all right, I know, I know the room's on fire and I could come up with some really insightful, you know, quote that tries to be, you know, the math equation to solve your problem. But in reality, I probably just need to go back to basics, break the problem down into its smallest parts and go step by step and get through it. Um, and the other, the other piece of advice along the same lines is that things, it's not the end of the day, you know, like, uh, well, it's, things are going to get better. Um, the sun, I, I kind of like to say that the sun's going to go down and the sun's going to come up and there's nothing you can do about it. This problem isn't going to stop that from happening. Um, and so trying to put things back into perspective for people is something that I find myself doing a lot. And then the other thing is pushing kind of back to our previous conversation, pushing people away from the, from, from the obvious idea. Um, it's really easy when you're, I mean, as an agency and really as a designer, as a creative, you're under pressure. You've got a lot of things, a lot of factors in the strategy to solve for. You've got time constraints. You've got subjective opinions coming from your creative director or your client or something like that. A lot of pressure to get it right. And the easiest thing to do is kind of follow the path of least resistance. The first good idea. And I think, again, this is a very, very cliche, very obvious piece of advice, but don't follow the first idea um, and uh, look for the unobvious or non-obvious solution to something and uh, find a breakthrough. 
and uh, just force yourself to do that. I don't know. You know, I think that's, I, I, I kind of smile, I laugh because those are such obvious pieces of advice, but I think they're super important and people lose sight of that when looking for something more, more insightful, more, uh, more complex in terms of advice. I think that's the, uh, the Occam's razor, maybe the break the advice down to the most simple solution. I think, uh, that's pretty awesome. Um, John, before we let you go, um, do you have any asks or requests to our audience, anything that you want to encourage our listeners or challenge them to do? Well, it goes, yeah, definitely. And that's what we were talking about before. I, I, I challenge, you know, if your job, well, your job, regardless of where you are and what you're doing, um, unless you're purely an artist, which don't change, stay there. That's amazing. Um, it is to, you know, is to solve sys- system like problems. Um, and so my challenge is to start from a story perspective, start from the human perspective, ask, you know, what, what about humans? I'm trying to solve this one thing here. I um, mean, it could be coming up with a brand voice and vision and message, and that's a great problem to solve, but it, you know, I think going back to the basics of what about humans, it's kind of like that, that, um, the five whys uh, concept, mm-hmm. but asking instead of five whys, it's the five, what about humans? So what about humans is relevant to this problem? What about humans will help, you know, what will, will be affected by these solutions? Um, and I think if we do that and we do, and we really press hard on that as designers and as strategists and creatives, we'll not only come up, create better work, but I think that we'll have a chance to create work that has a more positive impact long-term if you really think about it. Yeah. I love that. Um, John, tell us where our listeners can connect with you online or learn more about Handsome. Well, Handsome is handsome.is as the website. So go there, check out what, check out, check out the agency, uh, check out the work. There's a way to get in touch with the agency in general there. If you're interested in doing that, Otherwise, LinkedIn is the best place for me. Uh, John Rocher on LinkedIn. You can feel free to send me a message. Uh, I'm pretty responsive and happy to meet with anyone. And uh, I just love connecting with people in the community. So feel free. Awesome. Love it. Well, John, it's been a pleasure connecting with you and learning more about your story. So thanks for being on today. Yeah, it was a great conversation. Thanks a lot. Yeah. And thank you for being obsessed with design. Okay, kids, that's episode number 156 in the books. For all of today's show notes, head over to obsessedshow.com. And if you haven't already while you're there, add your email address to our newsletter. I'll update you on some of my favorite new episodes and some cool things I find in my daily obsessions. Of course, all the links are over at obsessedshow.com to all the places you can find this show, iTunes, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, SoundCloud, Google Play, and Spotify. So no matter where you find your podcasts, chances are you can listen to Obsessed Show from there. Just head over to obsessedshow.com. The Obsessed Show is produced by yours truly, Josh Miles. To have me speak or MC at your next event, head over to joshmiles.com to learn more. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.